Good morning. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of Jesus Christ as we gather this beautiful day to stand before God and worship. It is indeed a good day to be in the house of the Lord and we are glad that all of you are here. We have just a few announcements this morning. Uh, we will be observing the Lord's Supper today and as you can see we'll be doing it the uh, old-fashioned way, not in tension this morning. So we'll be using trays. Uh, so I know some folks will be glad to, to see that and, and learn that news. Uh, next Sunday, I should let you know, is going to be a very busy day in the life of the church. Uh, we'll have the men's breakfast Sunday morning at 8.30, so that will uh, be going on. We're going to have worship at the normal regular time, and worship will include next week a baptism. So we're excited about that, so come and be a part of that. Uh, then afterwards, we'll have session meetings. So if you're on the session, uh, we'll be meeting immediately after worship uh, for session meeting. And then that afternoon, uh, beginning at 6 o'clock, or that evening, beginning at 6 o'clock, we'll have the Low Country Boil, which is a little later this year, but I think hopefully it'll provide for some cooler weather and a good time. And we're going to have bluegrass music uh, outside for us. It's going to be an outstanding uh, event that you'll all want to come and be a part of. So next Sunday is going to be a big day. I'm just going to stay up here all day long. Uh, just makes sense. I may even spend uh, Saturday night up here. I don't know. Uh, but uh, come and be a part of all the things that are happening. Uh, the festivities are continuing to be planned for Kirkin of the Tartans, which will be at the end of this month on the 28th. Please make plans to be here for that. Uh, and tell other people about it. it. You know, we as Presbyterians are not fantastic always about inviting people to come to church. It's not our thing because it's perilously close to evangelism. And I know that's, that's, that's hard. We have to be careful about that. However, it's a great day to say, hey, you know, we're going to have bagpipes at church on Sunday. We're going to have a lot of neat stuff. We're going to have an ever-growing number of men in kilts at church on Sunday the 28th. Come and be a part of it. Come and see what that's all about. That's an easy way to invite somebody to come because I know how it feels. Sometimes it feels like when we invite people to come to church, it's like saying, hey, would you like to come to church and stay for 15 or 20 years and see how it works out? And if you quit coming after five years, I'm going to get my feelings hurt. That's how people hear it, and that's how we feel like it, we're saying it. So we can invite them to something like this, because we Presbyterians are good at inviting people to good, uh, fine music uh, things. We're good at that. So invite folks to come. Come and be a part of the lunch. Come and be a part of the festivities. Come and see what's going on here at First Presbyterian. It's a great day to invite friends. Now, this Wednesday evening, we'll have our pumpkin carving event on Wednesday night. And I want to say thank you to everybody that's been coming out loyally the, the past few Wednesday nights. It's been going really, really well. Uh, we've had great attendance. Uh, the kids have been having a good time. Uh, I think everybody's pretty much tired of hearing about Jonah. But I think we've covered Jonah pretty well over the last three weeks. So uh, the pumpkin carving will be this week. And that's going to be a lot of fun, too. So come out and be a part of that. And one of the things we're really seeing with this is people are really enjoying coming for the food and the fellowship that starts between 5 and 6. Uh, you don't have to get there immediately on time, but we're seeing a lot of people that are doing that just so they can stay and be a part of everything that's happening. Friends, those are all of our announcements this morning. So, oh, well, one more. I want to say thank you to all of the folks that helped out and made uh, the Presbyterian Women's Booth out at Squealing on the Square a uh, success. I was up there... Uh, a little bit, uh, not like some folks were, but I was up there a little, and every time I was there, there were people coming through and doing busy stuff. It was a really hot weekend, uh, but, uh, and I haven't heard the numbers yet, but my sense was that there, this was a successful event for the PW, and um, thank you all, for everybody that baked something for it, everybody that came and, and uh, did that. Uh, Kay Monroe did a lot, I know, to help set up the booth, and so did so many others. So thank you all for being a part of that and making uh, that work. And I want to say one last special thank you. Uh, it's not a story that's going to be in the sermon today, but I want to say thanks, and we're in for a treat as we are every time that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. I want to say thank you to Lonnie Bixler for baking bread for us. So everybody knows uh, there were people paying good money to get loaves of his bread up there at the, at the PW booth, and we're going to get to celebrate it 
uh, celebrate his talents along with celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper today. Friends, those are all of our announcements. So let us turn our hearts and our minds to God's worship. Friends, I invite you to rise and join with me for our call to worship, which is responsive and is found found in our order of worship this day. We have come together to praise God, from whom all blessings flow. We will dwell in the house of God all the days of our lives as one people. Let everything breathe that let everything that breathes worship and praise God.
Friends, if we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Therefore, let us come before God and neighbor and confess our sin and brokenness, first as one body and then in silence. Holy and merciful God, you are our judge, for you alone know us fully. You know the sins we hide from others, the unkind thought, the unspoken word of grace, the helping hand not offered. You alone know how we harbor jealousies and resentments, hoard resources for ourselves, and hold on to prejudices, judging others. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us into your marvelous light so that we live before others as you intend. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, it is the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ, God is reconciling the whole world to God's self. So friends in Christ, I assure you, we are forgiven. Friends, you may be seated. If all the children will come forward, please.
We remember that he was eating out with his friends one time, and they ate just like that. And he told us to do that and remember him. So we're going to take communion today, and we're really going to enjoy it. So we all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for inviting us to take communion. Help us to see you in everything we do. Amen. We now have a minute for mission hosted by the not quite ready for prime time players. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, these four church members are just like you and me or any other church member. Let's listen to some of their thoughts as they consider bringing their tithes and offerings to the Lord. See if you can hear yourself. Well, maybe. Not be a 
I'd probably be hunting or coughing. Even here in your presence, I'm here. I've come faithfully to the church, and I gladly tithe now. Lord, this is for you. Uh, oops, I must have left my wallet in the car. <laughs> Friends, you may be seated. I have a note here from the ushers asking that you please refrain from placing shoes in the offering plate. <laughs> Not sure what that's about. Okay. Friends, our pastoral prayers of the people today will not include the Lord's Prayer. We will do that during uh, communion. Uh, the bulletin is a little bit off on that front, but I invite you to join with me now, uh, joining our hearts and our minds in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this place and this opportunity to come before you and to worship. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will move among all of us as the word is read and as the word is proclaimed, move all our hearts to your service, Lord. Hear our prayers as we come before you. Lift us up into your presence as we see the word of God embodied in the Lord's Supper this day. We offer all these prayers to you. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading from Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2, and then continuing in verses 12 through 19. I invite you to hear now God's word to the church this day. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me, Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Continuing in verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians. I'll be reading from chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. I invite you to hear now Paul's letter to the, first, to the church in Corinth. And hear as he discusses with them some issues about partaking of the Lord's Supper. Listen for what God is saying to the church today. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you, drink this, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you, procl- you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. We're going to tell some stories this morning. Some fun stories. Maybe an odd story to start off with. When you're getting ordained to be a minister in the Presbyterian Church, there is a seemingly endless line of examinations that you get to go through. Uh, Ordination is harder than just moving on to a different church. Even though presbyteries examine you before you come into a new presbytery, if you're getting ordained, you're getting examined for ordination and you're getting examined for admittance into that presbytery. And so it seems like at every turn, someone's got another question for you. So you spend a lot of time keeping complex theological ideas at thumbnail reference, uh, being able to talk about this or that. And you're ready for them, more or less. You hope so. You get by good enough, I suppose, to get by the folks. You just demonstrate all this knowledge that you've supposedly read and written about all through seminary. And so in one of those meetings, one of those times when I was about to get ordained, in one of those long processions of questions and answers and examinations, someone, somewhere, a nice nicely dressed, older lady, sitting across a table from me, somewhere, I think out in Arkansas, looked at me and said, what do you think of communion? Well, that was odd. Normally when people ask you questions in these types of things, it's not opinion type questions. It's and it's not open-ended like that. What do you think about communion? I really was not expecting that. I was, I was ready to give her Martin Luther's idea about communion and John Calvin's idea about communion and uh, other ideas about communion. And she looked at me and she said, what do you think about communion? It took every bit of restraint that I had to not just look back at her and say, I'm for it. Because I think she would have wanted a little more to that answer, and it might have reflected uh, bad uh, on me at the time. What I did say, 
was the first thing that came off the top of my head. And I guess that's what she was going for. I, I don't know. But it may have been just as surprising to her as if I had said, I'm for it, when she asked me what I thought about communion. Because I looked at her, and without really thinking about it much, I just said something. And I said, well, it reminds me of going to eat at a Mexican restaurant. I know, yeah. Is it kind of the look that y'all have? Yeah. <laughs> That's the look that she had. Like, oh no, <laughs> this may not go well. And then I explained to her why. You see, parents of young children, or if you've had young children, you'll remember this, but parents of young children know why this might have been the case. If you have young children, especially when you have your first child, after about three or four months, I forget exactly what the timeline is, we've been at home with this baby and somehow the baby is still alive and we're still alive. We're walking zombies because we can't sleep much, but we're all still there, and we decide that we're a family and that we want to go out to eat because we used to do that a lot. Jennifer and I could remember. Before we had children, we went out to eat together. We'd go on dates. It was great. I think we did. Anyway, um, that was a while back. So you remember going out. And so we get ready, and we grab up all the stuff. We had two bags. Jennifer had a bag, and I had a bag. And we've got enough diapers to diaper uh, most of Birmingham at the time. And um, we're ready for, like, a major diaper situation if it happens. We've got extra food in the bottles ready to go. We've got some, you know, extra bottles there in powder form. We've got some warm water ready to go just in case in a thermos, in case we can't get to warm water quickly to give the baby a bottle, and we're ready to go. We've got... Uh, uh, rags and uh, towels and wet wipes and everything, you name it. We, we got a first aid kit just in case some emergency comes up on the way there. We're ready to go. And so we then stop to think, well, where can we go to eat? And we come to the truth that every other young family comes to if they decide in the first few months of infancy that they want to take their child out to eat with them and that is you go to the Mexican restaurant. You go to the Mexican restaurant because it doesn't matter if the baby wakes up and starts screaming her little head off. It just goes into the din of noise that's already there. And nobody really cares. It's loud. It's exciting. People are there and they're having a good time and you can have a little extra noise and nobody will notice. If we were to go down to the nice restaurant that we used to go to on our dates and the baby then starts screaming her head off, people are gonna look at us ugly. We're not gonna be there long. People are gonna say, why would they do that? I'm trying to have a nice dinner and those people brought their child in here. So anyway, we're, we're back talking to this woman about communion, and I'm talking about the finer niceties of Mexican restaurants. The point is that I finally came around to, maybe, uh, maybe not gracefully that day, and maybe not even gracefully today, but the point is that when I think about coming to the table, I think about this big room full of happy people, this place that we can all come to, this place where if we make a little noise because we're upset, that's okay. We've got people there to take care of it. And it is a place where the joyful noise just sort of is aided by every other voice that comes into it. Most of the time, everybody's having a good time. Everybody's being served. Everybody's being a part of things. It's a festive, happy activity. And what I wanted her to know was that when I think about communion, when I think about the Lord's Supper, and I hope you'll start to think about it this way once or twice yourself, we should think of a big, very joyous table. We should think about a place that we can go that is a joyful place. 
a place that we can come to that as it did for Jennifer and me and new parents everywhere that answered a longing for us just to go and be a part of things. We'd been in the house cooped up for a good solid three months and we were kind of getting tired of just seeing the four walls of where we lived and going uh, back and to and from the office and dealing with things. We were ready to get back out into the flow of the community. We were ready to be with other people. We were ready to be with other people that wanted to do the same things that we did. And when I think about coming to this table, that's what I think about. This is a joyful place for us to come. A place where we can come, even if we're just getting back into it, even if there's a little bit of crying along the way, we're prepared to take care of that too. It made me think about the fact that going to this place that we could go was just like coming to the table because it's a place where we could go and belong. It was a place where we could go and be a part of things and be smiled at and welcomed in no matter what it was that we had with us that at that moment would have made it hard for us to go and sit at and among other tables. It wasn't about the food. It really wasn't. Everybody gets chips, everybody gets salsa. That's just one of those things that happens. It wasn't about the food. It was about being in that place with those people at that time, celebrating where we had come to in life and what that meant, and knowing that their stories might be a little different, but looking over and across at other tables and seeing other folks just like us, maybe sometimes people we knew, and pulling the tables together so they're kid their baby and our baby could all sit together and if they started making noise they could make noise together Paul this morning in these words that are familiar to you because you hear them every time we do the Lord's Supper Paul is using them as part of a greater purpose he's talking to the church in Corinth who's having a little bit of difficulty maybe like that restaurant I told you about that if we had gone with our infant child they might have looked at us and said, oh, why are they here? Paul was having a problem with the church in Corinth because he found out that they were getting together and some folks would get there very early, people that weren't maybe working quite as long. And the church in Corinth was a wide disparity of people that had lots of resources and wealth and could get and host a dinner early and folks that might just get there later. And the folks that got there early, the ones that had a little bit more wealth than means, they would eat and drink and they would get together and they would sort of observe the Lord's Supper kind of as a closed group. They didn't, you know, they kind of, kind of didn't like it when the dirty, noisy people showed up later. They just liked to do it on their own. And Paul said, that's not the way it's supposed to look. You see, this table that the Lord said is about hospitality. It's about every one of you being welcome. It's about everyone in the church coming together in this place and celebrating who they are and what their stories are that brought them there in the first place. And the story that they celebrate that brought them there in the first place is the story that he talks about in the words of institution that that Jesus breaks the bread with his disciples on the very night that he was betrayed. He shares the cup with them and then goes on to his arrest and death. You see, that's the story that calls everybody together, no matter what all of their individual stories were, whether they were rich and hosting the meal or whether they were poor and just getting there when they could. They all got there eventually, but not everybody was able to eat. It was kind of humiliating for the folks that showed up late. And so Paul takes them to task for this. He says, no, this is not how it's supposed to be. It, Paul didn't know about Mexican restaurants, but that's, if he did, he would have said, that's what you're looking for. You want a place where everybody can come in and be a part of things. And he says to the church in Corinth, Examine yourself. Look at yourselves. Think about what you're doing when you gather. 
When you gather together, it's not just to see who can get there. It's to celebrate who you are as the church, who we are as the church, and to celebrate around a table and to celebrate around a story. In the same way, we're called to examine ourselves Not to come to this place flippantly, not to come to this place and say, oh, well, uh, communion this morning will be there another 15 minutes. But to remember that communion and the Lord's Supper is an essential part of who we are, not just as this congregation, but as the congregation of the church of Jesus Christ, the church eternal. And our liturgy will say that we celebrate this day with believers from every time and place. And so we imagine a much bigger table than the one that sets before us. A table that sits us at the same place as people that that have come before us. And a table that sits us around a long, joyous place in common cause with churches and congregations everywhere. And we pay particular attention to that here on World Communion Sunday which I'm proud to say a tradition that was started by a Presbyterian church. And it started very humbly back in the early part of the last century. A Shadyside Presbyterian church thought it would be a neat idea to invite some of the other churches literally just around the block from them to celebrate one time a year to celebrate communion on the same day that they did. And it took off. After making it a sort of a block-wide thing, then they all of a sudden they, they got the whole city of Pittsburgh just about to do it. And then they said, well, you know, if we can get Pittsburgh, and we, get, we can get all of Pennsylvania. There's a lot of folks in Pennsylvania at the time, even then. And they could do that too. And then that was what blossomed into World Communion Sunday. This idea that even though we do it differently, even though we sit at different tables, we all gather around the one common joyful table of Jesus Christ where we share and celebrate the story that calls us all together in the first place Paul calls the Corinthians to examine themselves he's basically saying think about what you're doing think about the words that I just told you think about what Christ did And think about whether the way you're doing things invites people in to be a part of that story or not. Now this week in the preview that I gave for the sermon, I mentioned that we talk about we talk about the Lord's Supper in just about all of our publications because it's central to what we do. And the confession in 1967 has some neat things to say about it. It says that the Lord's Supper is a celebration of the reconciliation of men and women with God and with one another, in which we joyfully eat and drink together at the table of our Savior. And listen to these words. We rejoice at the foretaste of the kingdom, which will bring to consummation at his promised coming, and go out from the Lord's table with courage and with hope for the service to which we're called. This is what Paul is calling the Corinthians to do. To greet each other, greet one another joyfully. To be nourished at this meal and not see it as just a party that some people enjoy more than others, but see it as a place where everyone can be gathered together and they can go out and share their story with the world and do the work that God calls them, and I might say by extension, us to do. You see, it's not so much about the food. He's not giving them a hard time about the food. It's about the fact that something amazing happens when we come and enter into this place. And our voices join the noise and the joy in this place that is with everyone else's. And we lose ourselves in that and we find ourselves lifted into the presence of God. It's all about remembering that we come to this place not just by ourselves, not just because it's the first Sunday of the month, but because this is a table we are to visit often 
And this is a table that we are to visit with joy. Because when we come here, we are reminded that we are made a part of God's story. In the bread and in the cup, we partake and we are part of God's ongoing story in our lives, in this place, and in the world. And we're reminded that in this place, we are always called to make room for more. To look around and see that we are celebrating with Christians all over the world this day. And that even though that's a really big table, there's room for more people. And there's room for people no matter where they are. No matter where they are geographically, no matter where they are spiritually, there's room for everyone to come to this place. I'll tell you another story. It's another story about another uh, Mexican restaurant. Can you see a theme forming? And I promise you, I know exactly where my kids are going to go want to go to eat after church today. There's a restaurant in Birmingham called La Paz, and we laughed at this place after many years because it was the trendy, hip place to go for young couples that were dating. Thursday nights were big at La Paz because you were almost a Friday, you might as well go out. Uh, and so it was a great place to go and Jennifer and I went there a lot we didn't live far away from that restaurant and we went there and when we early in our in our dating life we looked around and we saw a room full of people many of whom we knew from college but folks that were our age couples sitting at all these tables that were made just for two people and they would sit there and they would eat and we would all eat and and have Mexican food, and maybe you'd go see a band or something later, or maybe you'd just hang out at that restaurant all evening long, and that would be fun. And everybody liked to go there, and it was a fun place to be and to go. We didn't think much about that. That was just something you did. Years later, we went back with our bags of diapers and our supplies and our baby in the, in, the, in the carrying case that gives you a shoulder problem if you carry it too long, you know, the car seat that you carry and you, you can do it under that. And, and so, and you, you hope that you can rock the car seat that the baby will sleep. And so we'd go back like that. And all those tables there were now four tops. And we looked around and we saw all these same people that we used to see years ago that were there at the two top tables enjoying their Thursday nights. Now they were back at Four Tops with children, just like us, sitting up at the table with them. And the weird thing was we saw so many of the same faces that we'd seen there before. And we saw each other at this different phase in life. It reminds me today that no matter where we are, in the story of our individual lives. Whether we're in a place where it's a struggle just to get out of the house some days, whether we're in a place where it's easy for us and it's just another thing on the list, whether we're in a place where we're not sure what's coming next, that this place, this table, calls us to come and be a part of things. no matter where we are in the story of our church, as we look forward. And you're going to be hearing a lot about that over the coming weeks, what our, what our past has been, what our present is, and what our future can be here at First Presbyterian. No matter where we are in the story of our church, we're called to this place because this is the real important stuff of what we do. We're called here we celebrate here. We eat and drink together here. Because we remember. We remember what Christ did. We remember what Christ is doing. And we look forward with hope to what Christ will do in this place. And in each one of our lives. No matter 
what stage of life we come to this table with. We are all welcome, and we are all called to celebrate and to be joyful. And this is why World Communion Sunday is so important. And this is also the good news that we celebrate, that this table is always set for us, old and young, broken and feeling a little stronger, happy and sad. We're called to come and be renewed, to be lifted up, to be healed, and to be strengthened so that we may go out and truly be the church. That's what our story is, and that's the story that we are made a part of. Nothing less than God's own story. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, I invite you to rise and join with me now that the word has been read and the word has been proclaimed let us together affirm the faith into which we've been baptized and in which we live by using the ancient words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, we are called to offer ourselves just as Christ offered himself to us. So let us joyfully do this now by prayerfully considering how we might go out into the world and be the hands and the feet of the body of Christ. And let us give now also of our tithes and offerings.
holy, loving God, we pray that you will take these gifts and put them to work in this place and in places far away from here. We pray, Lord, that you will take each of us and put us to work also as builders of your kingdom, so that we may truly be the hands and the feet and the voices of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Brothers and sisters, this set before us is indeed the joyful feast of the people of God. We're told in Scripture that people will come from the east and the west and the south and the north. They will gather and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they were able to recognize him. Friends, this is indeed the Lord's table. And our Savior invites all those who trust him to share this feast which has been prepared. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Friends, let us continue in prayer. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. It was in your wisdom that you made all things and you sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, Refusing to trust or obey you, still you did not reject us, but claimed us as your own, sending prophets to call us back to your way. And then in the fullness of time and out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. And therefore we praise you and join our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets and apostles and martyrs, and indeed, with the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. And Jesus, who was born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to the needy. In dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. And seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. And together, we join in praise and in supplication, saying the prayer that you teach us this pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
he poured it out, saying to his friends and his disciples, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you take of this bread or you drink of this cup, do it.
called us to this place to celebrate this table with you. We look forward, Lord, to this gathering each time that we come here. We pray that you would sustain us until we gather again to go out and to do your work. We look forward joyfully to the time when we are all seated at your table at the heavenly feast. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Now the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each of you.